Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Good, very good. Thank you. Praise be to God. Thank you for coming out again. You've been with us before on the Dean Show. A few times. And we, we're glad that you're back with us again. And we're excited. We want to hear your story. Some of many of the viewers that tune in regularly to the Dean Show, they've gotten to heard, but many haven't. Yes. So we're going to kind of uh, go back and try to help bring this story to the rest of the, the world. And we're going to try to let even more people benefit. Really quickly, you were a former Christian youth minister. Yes. And you grew up going to church every um, day, every other day, because you, from what we were told before, you actually lived next to a church. Yeah, I lived a couple of houses down from a couple the church. A couple of houses down. So... Let's uh, start from there. And tell us uh, real briefly, uh, for the people that don't know, most of our viewers know who you are, but for those that don't, tell us a little about yourself and let's go on into your story and how you came to this beautiful way of life, Islam. Well, as they say about the beginnings, let's begin there. I was born and raised in Greenville, South Carolina in a very, um, in a very traditional Methodist, Christian, Southern, conservative home. Um, I was raised by my grandparents, you know, my mother had stepped out and you know, my dad was working two jobs, uh, so he was not home a lot, so I, I spent a lot of time with my retired grandparents, um, and they were very old-fashioned, as they say, you know, um, old-fashioned in the sense to give you some sense of how old-fashioned they were, you know, like, girls were a no-no in my house, you know, like, uh, if, if I wanted to invite a girl over, it wasn't just, you know, just invite a girl over, bring into my room, you know, I, my grandmother had to know in advance, you know, appointment had to be made, um, we had to, she had to meet her first, then we had to sit in the formal living room, you know, the living room with all the nice stuff where you don't go unless you have company over. And she would either sit in the room and listen to the conversation, or she would sit in the next room, in the, the dining room, where the TV and stuff was, and with the door open and listen. You know, there was no girls in my room, or you know, that was like, out. Um, so they were very, very traditional, very old-fashioned, very conservative, um, Southern Methodist family and they started taking me to church at a very young age you know this was something that was always a part of my house you know the the reading the bible was always a part of my my life um praying before we ate pray, my grandmother prayed before we went to sleep you know every time the wind blew my grandmother prayed you know and this was something i grew up hearing all the time and i went to church every sunday you know i went to sunday school you know my grandmother would drop me off in sunday school then go do their thing and come out and when i got older i started attending the regular services and then i would say at about the age of 14 maybe 13 14 getting close to 15 i i started attending the the saturday night youth services at the gym at our church you know and it wasn't like regular church it wasn't formal you know it was more like we went and we played games and you know there was it was fun interaction it was all teenagers it was pizza you know uh, sodas, you know, all, all this fun stuff. And at the end, the youth, min the youth pastor, the youth minister would um, give, you know, like a 30 minute sermon or a 30 minute lecture, you know, about how we need to draw closer to God, you know, something along that nature. And just so happened that the youth pastor at the time lived catty corner to me, he lived, um, you know, across the street, uh, one house up from me. And we became friends. You know, because we used to walk, and he used to walk to the church, I used to walk to the church, so we would see each other, meet each other. And then in my senior year in high school, when I was 15, he used to give me a ride to school, because this was before I had my, um, my license, and he had his license, he was a senior. So he used to give me a ride to school. And then after he graduated high school, he started going to Bob Jones University, which was and is one of the most conservative, rigorous Bible training colleges in the country. And he was studying textual criticism, which is... Uh, a field where you go into the Bible and derive from the original Hebrew and Greek, you know, the, you, you find out which one of all these hundreds and thousands of fragments of, of pages of the Bible, of pages of books, of pieces of books, of this, that, and the other. You go through, and a uh, textual critic goes through and deciphers which one of these are the, the oldest, you know, by studying the, you know, the, where they came from and, and, and studying the ancient manuscripts and carbon dating, all this other stuff. But then they use the text to also try to derive which is the original mm -hmm. because you know just because a, a document is older does not mean it's necessarily the, the original document you know because the oldest document could have been copied from a non-existent document that had errors and it could have been a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy but a newer manuscript could have been copied once from an original therefore that would make that 
manuscript more original than the older manuscript. So this is something, this is the challenge that a textual critic has to come up with, and it's a lot of scrutiny because there's no real science behind it. You know, it's a lot of um, of you, you know, going through and looking at these things with your own hands. And um, as I got to know him and befriend him, I began to emulate him. You know, I began to, as he was studying, I was studying. You know, I was trying to learn along with him, because. And I became more involved in the church, and I began to realize that I wanted to, you know, dedicate my life to the to this to this cause. I want to dedicate my life to Christianity. This is where I fit in. This, this was what my. This you grew up believing. This, this is what, what I grew up. This was in. my niche. You know, I wasn't big into the parties and all. You know, at this age, I I was not. You know, I was my grand grandparents were not not having that. My grandfather basically. My grandfather was not. He was a very, you know, firm, stern. You know, like very strong figure in my family. Like he was not having it. Um, so I, I fell into this lifestyle, was going to these different things on Wednesday nights, Thursday nights. You know, there would be things going on like um, uh, Crusaders for Christ and all, all this stuff. I, you know, I was attending everything I could get my hands on, reading this, that, and the other. You know, um, reading things by, by, um, from the Moody Institute, um, all of these different things. So I decided in my um, freshman year of high school, I decided that I wanted to go to Bob Jones University. And there was a very long waiting list, so I had already enrolled. Now, how old were you at this point? Uh, 15. 15. 15 at this time, uh, going on 16. So I wanted to go to Bob Jones and emulate uh, my friend. Um, as I started studying more with him and started learning a little bit of Hebrew, a little bit of Greek, started reading the Bible for myself, me and him both decided we're going to start from the beginning of the Bible and we're going to read it from beginning to end doing a study, beginning to end, you know, like not over a period of a year, but as quickly as we can, beginning to end, beginning to end. And I did this, I would say probably about two times. And the second time around, the first time I started noticing some things that did not really sit right with me, but because it was such a large book, you know, I figured, you know, maybe I just missed some things along the way. The second and the third time, the fourth time, is when I really started to pick up there's something wrong here, you know, because Number one, the Bible taught that uh, Noah was an alcoholic, you know, and, and to me, I, it didn't fit right, you know, because I have seen family, mem family members that had dealt with alcoholism, and an alcoholic has trouble holding down a job at a fast food restaurant, you know, doing simple tasks that involve uh, uh, logical thinking. So now, if Noah just, wasn't... J just to point out, Noah would be one of God's messengers. Yes, Noah is one of the very earliest messengers speaking of in, in the Bible. He was a very, very early messenger. We're not just talking about some ordinary man. No, 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 we're talking about God's prophet. And Noah was actually the one God commanded to, to, to build the ark, to save humanity mm -hmm. when he destroyed the world with a flood. Yeah. So Noah was given the task of saving this world with an ark by building a huge ark all by himself. And I'm thinking to myself... How does an alcoholic accomplish this? Number one, how does he know that it was God speaking to him if he was drunk? Now, what does the Bible actually say about him drinking? That he was a drunkard and would be passed out in this drunken state. It, it refers to him, Noah was a drunkard. Yeah. This statement is in the Bible. It says Noah in the Bible. was a drunkard. Okay. So this didn't make sense to me. How could Noah be a prophet of God, build an ark to save humanity, he was an alcoholic? You know, so... Uh, you know, I kind of let that roll off my back. You, you go a little farther. Then you reach like the story of Lot, you know, Abraham and Lot. You know, Lot was the one who was of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, the, the ones, yes. the, the cities that were destroyed because of their homosexuality. It is said that Lot's daughters got him drunk, basically doped him up and slept with him and then bore children through this incest, mm -hmm. you know. And again, this is supposed to be a prophet of God. Then you get to the story of David. David is considered one of the greatest prophets of, of the Jews and of Christians. David, the one who constructed, uh, reconstructed the Temple of Solomon in, in Jerusalem. And you get to his story, and his story in the Bible says that he saw a woman, um, Bathsheba, and she was you know, laying out sunbathing or whatever, and decided that he could not control his desires that he wanted her. So he took her, slept with her, basically raped her, decided he wanted to keep her. She was married. So and her husband was one of the generals in his army. So decided the way I need to clean this up was he sent a letter to his armies because they were at war at that time. Sent a letter to, one, to, his, to his generals that when the battle gets fierce, leave Uriah. 
Just, just, just abandon him, let him fight on his own. So that he would be killed, and now he could have Bathsheba legally. So, and I'm thinking to myself, like, you know, like, this is stuff you, you see on America's Most Wanted, you know? This is stuff you, you, you see on, on, on FBI Most Wanted list. And now, just to nature. note that many people don't read the Bible, so they don't see these stories. They usually go to church, and people will take certain verses and recite certain verses, but you actually went deep into it, so you got to see the whole picture now. Yeah, I got to see the whole picture, you know, and all of these things did not sit right with me, you know, because I said to myself that these are supposed to be prophets, you know, these are supposed to be the people who are supposed to guide me to the right character, you know, these are supposed to be people that, for the Jews, because, you know, as a Christian, I believe that the Old Testament was for the Jews. It was not for Christians. It was for Jews. But this was supposed to be the guiding post for the Jews. But these people were worse than, than people I've known that have spent their whole life in prison. These are people that not only would I not want to follow them, if I saw them on the street, I would turn and run the other way and go probably call 901 or America's Most Wanted because they got to be on somebody's list. So that was the first thing that, that said to me, something has to be wrong here. This, this, Either the stories are wrong, or these people can't be prophets. I mean, this just can't be. So finally, you know, you get to the New Testament. Or, you know, then you get some of the books going back. You get some, to some of the books like the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth, does not even the word God is not even in it. It's a story about two people who fall in love. And it has no, like if you read it, it has, you would think you're reading a romance novel. There's nothing about God in it. There's one of the books in the Bible. Yeah, there's a book in the Bible. The word God is not even in it. God is not even referred to in, in the book. And then there's other statements, which I would not repeat, that are pornographic in the Bible, you know, that, that, that speak about, you know, uh, um, David sleeping with this woman and then spilling the, the, the semen. I mean, it's just, these are things I would not read to my children. So I got to the New Testament, and the New Testament, you're like, ah, oh, you know, there's a little breath of fresh air, you know, because you make it through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But then as I start reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I started noticing something. That, that, that seemed weird was that, okay, all these guys are saying the same thing in a sense, but they're repeating themselves like, um, like Matthew and Luke are repeating the exact same things that are, in, that are in Mark. So it looks like they're copying from Mark. And then you get to John and John is, is a whole nother story. Um, so I'm saying that all these four guys saw the same person, saw the same events, but told them all in four different ways. You know, like this doesn't, like, which one is the, you know, the, the correct story? Things that if, if you were in a court of law, it wouldn't hold up. No. The attorney but, would throw it out. Yeah, no. Not only that, but when I started studying the Bible, I wanted to know who wrote these books. And also, I started researching the author. And when you go through the Old Testament, 80% of it, the author is unknown. It's unknown. speculated. They yeah. speculate who wrote it. Like, in the book of um, Deuteronomy, they say Moses wrote it. Which, which doesn't make sense because at the end, it says Moses died. So did Moses like write it on obituary? You know, like all of these things did not make sense to me. So you get through the New Testament. Okay, it made some sense to me as a Christian because I believed all the doctrine uh, of, of Christianity. And Jesus is talking about God, you know, worshiping God, that, you know, servitude and honor and respect should be given to God alone. He never accepted it for himself. He would always try to put that back on God. You know, even when they came to him, good master, you know, he would say, why thou callest me good? There's none good. But one, that's God. And then Jesus taught that, you know, he came to fulfill the law. And the law is the law of Moses. He said, I have come to fulfill the law of Moses. He was a Jew, come to Jews. Because he even himself was asked why he didn't preach to the Gentiles. And he was told that, he told them, why should I cast my pearl to swine? I was not sent, but to the lost sheep of the children of Israel. So these things didn't make sense to me. Why I, I Jesus was... Told that I was told that he was the salvation of all mankind, but even out of his own mouth, he's saying that he was sent but to the Jews, and that he was the one sent the lost generation of Israel to come to fulfill the law of Moses. So you get past the Old New Testament, and then you get to the writings of Paul. And the writings of Paul go from like center field to way out of the ballpark somewhere. Because now Paul all of a sudden introduces the creed. If you look at it, you know, from beginning to end without just teaching what the preacher says and listening to all these things bombarded at you from different ways. If you really look at it, it goes from Jesus saying one thing to Paul all of a sudden coming and saying, okay, Jesus died for your sins. You know, that, that you were born into sin because of Adam's, you know, uh, transgressions. You were born into sin. 
You inherited this sin nature. Now because of the sin nature, you need a redemption. Jesus had to come and sacrifice himself in order to free you from the sin nature. And I'm thinking to myself, I haven't read this. You know, like, where did Paul get this from? You know, because Jesus didn't say this. He didn't preach this. He didn't teach this. What about some people who say now that the Jews would actually sacrifice uh, animals in the Old Testament and they take examples from this? Okay, they, they did, and they yeah. still do. Yeah. And Muslims still do. Yeah. Because this is the, God's ways of doing things don't change. Yes. You, you know what I mean? He does not change his mind. God is not one way today and then wakes up and decides, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do it this way today. You know, we're going we're gonna to revamp this thing. We're going to re-scheme this, this whole salvation thing. You know, we're going to re-scheme it. We're just going to throw a whole monkey wrench in the system. Yeah. Or, better yet, I'm going to wait thousands of years and let all these other people die and then all of a sudden bring Jesus and say, okay, then, this is how you get salvation is through Jesus. Doesn't I'm sorry for all you other people, you know? That doesn't make sense. It, God, you know, it sounds like God would be playing with humanity, which God did not create us for this purpose, you know? God's ways don't change. So you started to see these things and question these and things. And I started to see them and question them. And when I would take them to the pastors, they would tell me the same thing. I would hear the same thing over and over again. You know, they would put their hand on my shoulder, you know, Brother Joshua, don't let a little bit of knowledge wreck your faith. This is what they tell me. Don't let a little bit of knowledge wreck your faith because the devil will give you 99% of the truth to get you to believe 1% of the lie. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I tried to do that because I did not want to lose my faith in Christ. This is all I had. This is all I knew. This is the way of my forefathers. This is the way of my family. So I tried to go back into the Bible and shove my mentality into trying to find a way to make this stuff fit. Make it make sense. Let me make this thing make sense. You know, let me make this Trinity thing make sense because the Trinity, after reading the Bible, it just started not making sense because there's no verses in the, the Bible that speak of the Trinity. There's one that if you study the Bible, was not original part of the Bible. It was put in, you know, later when the, when the, um, the, Rome, the Bible was put together in Rome. So I'm saying to myself out of all this, how do I fix this? Because Jesus is saying that, you know, the way to salvation, someone came and asked him, how do I get eternal life? He said, follow the commandments. He said, okay, I've done that. He said, okay, then follow me. You know, sell everything you own and follow me. This was the way to salvation. Follow the commandments. Paul gets to the way of salvation. Believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, if this was the way to salvation, why did Jesus not tell us this? Why did Jesus live his whole life and then say, you know what? If Paul had not come along, maybe they'll figure it out. I'm not going to tell them how to get salvation. I'm just going to let them try to deduce out of all these, you know, uh, um, ambiguous statements I make to let them figure it out thousands of years later. This does not make any sense to me. It doesn't me. make sense. I said, if God wants you to be a certain way, he would very clearly say, as Jesus very clearly said when he was asked, how can I get eternal life? I said to myself, and I told a pastor this, if the way to eternal life was believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, he would have said it then. He would have clearly said it. And there's nowhere in the Bible where Jesus explicitly says that I'm coming to die for your sins, believe in my blood and my resurrection, and then you'll be saved. You got paradise. Is there any explicit statement? There, that there's says? no explicit statement out of the mouth of Jesus Christ that has been verified by any Bible scholar. That he said, I came to die for your sins. There's none. Did Abraham say anything about there, this? There are some implicit, implicit verses that scholars... Of, by, of biblical scholars have deduced that this is what he meant but if you weigh those implicit verses with other explicit things that he said a ways to get salvation then, then they automatically the light of what he really meant comes to view can you give us a couple examples when we take this break and come right back on the Dean show check this out You're watching the Dean Show. This is the mailbag. We're taking a call right now. Yes, I know I've had you on hold. I appreciate that. Go ahead. And what's the question? Okay, we got it. Th thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, and be sure to watch us right here on the Dean Show. You know, every week, same time. That's right. right yo. Okay, salam alaikum wa All right, this is Yusuf Estes. We're here on the Dean Show. This is the mailbag, and we take calls. Uh, when it's live, when it's a live program, this is, we take the calls. Now, let me uh, go to the question of our caller, which coincides with one that I had received here. 
I find it. Here it is. This is asking a question about Jesus. And what do we believe about Jesus? Can Jesus be God? First of all, thank you for asking me about my religion. That's what we always say. We have the truth and we have the proof. The truth is, I can't lie or I go to hell. <laughs> That's in my religion. The other thing is, we have the evidence anyway. What does the Quran tell us about Jesus? We believe in a man by the name of Isa. Now, if you call him Jesus, that's up to you, but we know his name is Isa, and he was a miracle birth. His mother was named Miriam. We have a chapter of the Quran named after her, chapter 19. And his miracle birth, there was no human intervention here. There was no man. There was nobody who uh, uh, fertilized uh, any egg and, and implanted it in her like they do in modern days or anything like that. She had a miracle birth. And it was by the will of God. Almighty Allah willed it to be done. He says, Kun fayakun. Be and it is. And that's how Jesus came about. But does that mean he's God? Well, how is it that we got Adam in the first place? If he was <laughs> anything less than a miracle, I'd like to know because he has no father or mother. Adam was created from dirt. And Allah blew life into him. And then let's take the example of Eve. Eve was taken from a bone from Adam. We have this in our Quran, by the way. If you didn't know that, you need to know that we know Eve, she is created from Adam. And from these two, Allah says, they brought forth many people, many tribes, many nations. Allah brought forth on the earth. And he made us different from each other that we recognize each other. But at the same time, we look at Eve and we say, we would not worship her, even though she was born and created without any mother. We don't worship Adam. We don't worship Eve. So why should we worship Jesus? Just because he didn't have a father. Makes sense? There's another point, too, is let us look to Jesus and think, peace be upon him. Did he eat food? Yeah. Does God have to eat? Did Jesus sleep? Does God have to sleep? Allah doesn't sleep. He says in the Quran, Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayu qayyum, la ta'khuduhu sinatun walanaum. That He is Allah, beside whom there's none other to worship. The all living. He's always living. He's never been created. He didn't just start up one day. No, He's always living and always self subsisting. He doesn't need anything. He's not needy at all. And then it says, he doesn't sinatun, doesn't grow weary, <laughs> and he doesn't numb, he doesn't sleep. God doesn't get tired, he doesn't go into that twilight zone of ah, uh, and he doesn't sleep because he's Allah, he's not like a human. So get that in your mind. But now, what about eating? If you eat, don't you have to go to the bathroom? And you want to say that God went to the bathroom, I would do blessed stuff for Allah. This is too much for the Muslim mind to even contemplate that you would put God in the creation. Although we immediately recognize from the Quran itself that Jesus fulfilled scripture. He fulfilled prophecy. He came to fulfill prophecy that he would be the Messiah. That he would be the miracle birth, born of a virgin, and he was. And when he came, he brought a mighty message. And the message was, worship God without partners. To know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, and you have to love him and worship him with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. That's in the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29. Very clear. And that's the message of Jesus. Not worshiping him, but worshiping the one he worshiped. Who did Jesus worship when he prayed? And he said, and you pray who? To the one above. And how do you pray? God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when he was in the trials and the fitna that was coming about in Gethsemane, and he prayed and he was asking God, let this cup pass from me, but even so your will be done. Who's he talking to himself? And on the cross, according to the people that have him on the cross, the one on the cross is saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we wouldn't accept this. We won't accept that because no prophet would say God was forsaken them. It's the devil who is forsaken, not any of the prophets of God. They were always in the best care of Almighty God. And this is why Muslims say what we do. We believe that it is true that he is a mighty prophet. He is a miracle birth. He is the Messiah. He's Jesus 
or in Arabic, he's Isa. This is our belief. If you want to know more about it, though, go to the website for this purpose. Go to Bible Islam. Bible Islam dot com. Check it out for yourself and see what you think. And send us more emails like this or call us during our live shows. Let's return you back to the program in progress. You're watching The Dean Show right here. Welcome back to The Dean Show in The Dean Show studio. Former Christian youth minister. We're trying to have him share his story with us. And we left off with a couple examples that you're going to give us explicit and implicit. Implicit. Go ahead. Now, implicitly, he said it, and for those who, you know, so I can break it down, implicitly means that he said something that can be adduced or deducted that he meant this. Like, he didn't explicitly say, like, if I explicitly say that I am a Muslim, that's explicit. Or if you look at how I'm dressed, that's an implicit statement that I'm a Muslim. It's something you can deduce. Like, there's implicit statements that are made in the New Testament, like, you know, um, where he says that I came to do my father's work. And the, my father works through me, and he is in me, and I am in him. You know, things like, like this are implicit statements that, that lead one to believe, or if you just take them all by themselves, pull them out, you know, and look at them just all by themselves, and they would very much say to you that Jesus is saying, I am the God of the same substance. And this was the very argument that, that went down at the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D., when the, the creed was trying to be evolved because this was the very argument that they came up with. Was Jesus, what was his substance? Was he of the same substance as God or was he of a similar substance? You know, you had the Alexandrian creed and you had the Arian creed. And this is, you know, the Alexandrian creed eventually went out because of verses. And they debated these very verses that me and you are debating, are talking about now. But then you go to explicit statements of Jesus, like, you know, uh, why thou callest me good? For there's none good, but one that is God, or his explicit statement when he was asked, how do I get eternal life? How do I go to heaven? Follow the commandments. Go to the commandments. What commandments was he speaking of? He was a Jew. So he was speaking of the commandments of Moses. What was the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other God before me. Thou shalt not worship anything in the heavens or in the earth, or any graven images. You shall honor your mother, father, and mother. Love your neighbors, you love yourself. You know, and even Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Because the, the um, disciples were arguing about which commandment was greater. So they asked him. And he did not even say the Ten Commandments. He said that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. He didn't say to love me, your God. He said the Lord, the, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your strength. And love your neighbors, you love yourself. The other ten, the rest of them hang on these. So these, if you weigh these implicit statements with these explicit statements, then they make more sense. God was, he was saying that I am in the Father and the Father, that we have the same cause. I am here on behalf of God. I am God's delegate on earth. I am the Word of God made flesh, as is in John 1 and 1. That in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know, so there's explicit and implicit things. That, that, so these things weighed on me very heavily. You know, and I, <clears throat> I went to the pastor and I told them, okay, so tell me, how can I know Jesus was God? Or Jesus was only begotten of God. Only begotten from Hebrew meaning that only God can be attributed to his existence. You know, he has his, his lineages from God. So I, I went and asked, how could I know? Tell me how, how, you, how I know Jesus is the only begotten of God. How, is, how, how, how does he fit into this trinity? Show me. Show me some substance. Give me something. Because I was looking, I really wanted to believe, but I was not a fool, you know? I was not, you know, as they say, I was not raised fool, you know? I, my, my grandparents didn't raise me no fool. Show me something. And they, you know, and they started using, I said, I don't want to see all these ambiguous verses in the Bible. Give me some logical example. And they, you know, well, he was born of a virgin. The Virgin Mary, this was his miracle that he was his father lineage, because that's how the, you know, straight through the father, it ends at God. I said, okay, if that is the criterion, to be the son of God, or the only begotten son of God, does not Adam hold that title more being that God fashioned him with his own hand, out of nothing. No father, no mother, nothing. Took some dirt, molded it, said be, and there's a man. And then his wife pulled out a rib, created another one. So they don't, don't they have the more rights? So 
I said, does not Adam have more right to be the only begotten of God, being that he was created without a father and a mother? You know, that's when there was no more arguing. You know, they would just tell me, you know, you, you, you have let the devil deceive you, you know? They, I really started becoming more of an out Yes. So, so now that you start questioning, and, and I think this discourages people from starting to raise questions, people who have doubts, and that kind of keeps them locked up in a closet because they're scared to be labeled an outcast, le scared to be... Uh, yeah, because you start being looked at as the one who questions his faith. Because in Christianity, this is a, um, doubting the Holy Ghost is what they call it. Doubting the Holy Ghost, you know, doubting these things that you believe through blind faith is, a, is considered an um, unpardonable sin. Blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is considered an unpardonable sin. And so I made that cardinal mistake of questioning. Questioning those things which just you just believe. You know? shouldn't, shouldn't one ask to, to make sure that, look, what I'm buying, what, what, I'm, what I'm getting into is actually from God, is actually the correct way, and that's all you were trying to do. It's logical in everything you do. You wouldn't yeah. buy a car without asking how much it costs. Somebody yes. wouldn't just tell you, just sign this contract and we'll give you the car. You don't know how much does it cost for how long, how much do I have to pay a month. I mean, you're going to ask these things. Exactly. So when it comes to my afterlife, the life that I have to live forever, I want to know that I'm doing the right thing. Which is either paradise or hellfire. Paradise, heaven or hell. You know, that's it. There's, no, there's no two ways about it. In Christianity, same way, there's no two ways about it. Judaism, there's no two ways about it. You go one or the other. So you want to know that the place that you're choosing to go is going to be the right place. Yes, and the only thing that I had to go on was the Bible. Which this, was, this was it. Which things are, that weren't making sense at all. And they weren't, they didn't, they made no sense completely. We're going we're gonna to have to, Joshua, uh, have you back on for a part two to this. Tell us real briefly that um, something in closing. So, um, you know, what, what next step did you take in your journey? And then we'll continue on to bring you on next time. Where you can go further into the story, but what what was the, the the summary of all this? After all this, you know, I finally talked to one pastor or one Bible scholar who had a little bit of you know a little bit of uh, knowledge, and he was willing to say the truth. When I went to him about all these things and all these problems in the Bible, you know, he told me he said, you know what, brother Joshua, maybe the people who copied the copy of the copy just made a mistake, you know, which basically wrecked my faith in Christianity. I don't think he would very much uh, like that I attribute him to wrecking my faith in Christianity. But he did, and I left Christianity altogether because I knew that there was one God. I knew that he had a purpose for creating this world. I knew he had a purpose for placing me in this world, and every other person had a purpose. And I wanted to find out what that purpose was, so I, I began my search. And that led you to? Islam. Which means? Submitting to the will of the one true God. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, coming on. So stay tuned next week when we have Joshua Evans back again. We're going to go into part two on why he accepted Islam, his beautiful way of life, which is practiced by over 1.5 million people, billion people in the world. And we'll see you again, God willing, on the Dean Show. Assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you.